Imagine waking up to a decimated field, your livelihood in ruins, and the culprit? A group of seemingly harmless animals. Welcome to the harsh reality of farming. Today, we're diving into the top five animal groups that cause the most havoc on your farms and the innovative, sometimes surprising methods you, as a farmer, could use to protect your land. From the cunning deers to the voracious wild boars, it's a constant battle between man and beast. Join us as we dive into how American farmers deal with millions of invasive animals. Let's start by looking at wild boars. These wild pigs, also known as feral hogs, have quite an impact on community structure and ecosystem function due to their destructive feeding habits. They are omnivores and will eat almost anything. Their diet includes nuts, acorns, seeds, roots, fruit, rodents, and small reptiles. Sometimes they will eat carrion, such as downed livestock, especially lambs, kids, calves, wildlife, and the eggs of sea turtles. Their primary feeding habit is rooting disturbance, which involves plowing up the ground with their snouts and tusks to find food. This unearths plants in the burrows of ground-dwelling species. The rooting disturbance can reduce plant cover, diversity, and regeneration. Furthermore, predation and habitat destruction by boars can greatly affect animal communities. However, the effects of wild boar on fungi and aquatic communities are scarcely studied and soil properties and processes seem more resistant to disturbance. These attacks can also drive massive losses for farmers during planting and before harvesting by trampling or eating crops or rooting up and eating seeds before they can sprout. So how exactly can you avoid this? Well, farmers and landowners employ a variety of strategies to address the challenge posed by wild boars. One effective approach is the installation of a strong fence around the property, forming a robust barrier to keep wild boars away. These fences must be of sufficient height and strength to prevent the boars from either leaping over or breaking through. You can also step up a little and consider electric fences. Electric fencing serves as an impactful deterrent, adding an extra layer of protection. Another widely employed method involves the use of wild boar traps. These traps, typically constructed of heavy-duty metal, are baited with food to entice the boars inside. Once a boar enters the trap, the door automatically closes, securely confining the animal. There is also hunting, often assisted by trained dogs, the dogs play a crucial role in tracking and cornering the boars, enabling hunters to take precise shots. A deep understanding of boar anatomy is valuable in aiming for vital organs, ensuring a humane and effective kill. Given that wounded boars can pose an even more serious threat, a well-placed shot becomes quite important. In some regions, the aerial shooting method is employed for its efficiency, especially in areas with large boar populations and challenging terrains. This technique involves shooting boars from a helicopter or other aircraft, providing a strategic advantage in navigating difficult landscapes. To deter wild boars, farmers also utilize repellents including both topical applications and electronic ultrasound devices. These repellents emit sounds or odors that are unpleasant to boars, dissuading them from entering the protected area.
Moreover, a preventive measure involves the removal of potential food sources that might attract wild boars. Farmers are advised to consistently eliminate garbage and securely seal garbage bins, minimizing the likelihood of boars being drawn to the vicinity. In adopting these multifaceted methods, farmers and landowners aim to strike a balance between protecting their property and ensuring the humane management of wild boar populations. And as we are talking about countering wild boars, we can't forget about the state wildlife agencies. State wildlife agencies are also instrumental in managing and curtailing wild boar populations, employing diverse strategies to address the issue. Data collection and mapping are foundational aspects of their efforts. Wildlife professionals regularly contribute data to online databases, providing valuable tools for monitoring the distribution and expansion of wild pigs in North America. Advanced techniques, such as geostatistical downscaling, are employed to create detailed maps reflecting wild boar population density and distribution. The policy framework and actions undertaken by state wildlife agencies involve community-based measures, encouraging hunters and non-hunters to engage in wild boar hunting beyond the regular season is a proactive approach to reducing conflicts. Disease management is another vital facet, with the implementation of measures like banning wild boar hunting in or around infected areas, where compliance with biosecurity is challenging. The public trust doctrine forms the legal foundation for state wildlife management, asserting that wildlife is held in trust by the state for the benefit of all people. This doctrine guides policies and actions to ensure responsible and sustainable management practices. Understanding the human dimensions of wildlife management is also important, encompassing people's values, beliefs, and attitudes toward wildlife, influencing their behaviors and decision-making. Field research conducted in natural habitats is a cornerstone of state wildlife management. This approach provides essential insights into wild boar behaviors, diets, mating habits, habitats, and populations. The knowledge gained through field research informs evidence-based decision-making and enhances the effectiveness of wildlife management efforts. So the collaborative efforts of farmers, landowners, and state wildlife agencies employing various methods. From fencing and trapping to policy frameworks and field research, play an important role in addressing the challenges posed by wild boar populations. These multifaceted approaches, combining practical measures with scientific insights, contribute to the development of sustainable and effective strategies for wild boar management. But how do deer play a role in this agricultural drama? What strategies are used against these silent crop destroyers? The answers are coming up. Now let's look at deer as another threat. The four-legged friends might not be as friendly to your crops as you'd hope. These graceful creatures, especially fond of cereal crops like wheat and maize, can be quite the challenge when it comes to protecting your hard work from their appetites. According to some sharp biologists, about two thirds of the agricultural crop damage is caused by these mischievous species.
Now location matters. Where your fields meet the woodland is where the real issue would be. The closer to the woods, the higher the chance of an uninvited deer feast, often accompanied by some unintentional trampling damage as they navigate through the plots. If you're wondering why these deer are causing such a ruckus, it turns out it's not just personal, it's a density thing. The more deer hanging around, the more likely your crops are to suffer more damage. So it's not just about species, it's about how many of them are in your fields. Now let's put some numbers on the table. According to Rutgers University, the annual economic losses to high-value agricultural crops in New Jersey alone are soaring over $15 million. If you're raising an eyebrow, you're not alone. In a survey, a whopping 70% of farmers pointed their fingers at deer for their crop losses. That's like 7 out of 10 farmers dealing with some serious deer troubles. But the pain doesn't stop there. Nearly 40% of farmers reported losses they couldn't tolerate, and 25% had to bid farewell to a piece of their farmland because of deer damage. Imagine having to give up on your dream patch just because of some hungry deer. And here's a twist. 36% of farmers had to change their crops of choice because of these animals. But how can you avoid this threat? Let's look at ways you can counter them and safeguard your precious crops. Farmers seeking to protect their tomatoes from voracious deer have a range of tactics at their disposal, and the webpage emphasizes the effectiveness of scare tactics, fencing, and controlled hunting in deer management. Fencing stands out as the most efficient method with various resources advocating for a sturdy barrier at least eight feet tall to prevent deer from jumping over or penetrating through. Additional deterrents, such as branches, barbed wire, or ground level obstacles, enhance the fence's effectiveness. You could also decide to go with the scare tactics. The scare tactics involve an array of options From homemade or commercial repellents with unpleasant scents like cayenne pepper and garlic to hanging scented soaps, utilizing motion-activated sprinklers, deploying guard dogs, or employing wind chimes that startle deer with sudden noises. Companion plants, ultrasonic devices emitting sound waves only audible to deer, Fishing lines forming barriers and covering fruits with leggings are other creative strategies that can also be effective. Despite the diversity of methods, fencing comes out as the most effective choice. Controlled hunting emerges as another broader strategy for managing deer populations, with hunters granted access to specific lands. The method serves multiple purposes, including protecting landscaped areas, gardens, crops, and natural habitats. However, controlled hunting necessitates careful regulation and ethical considerations, and the rules may vary by location. In Ohio, for instance, specific shooting hours and bag limits are enforced, with deer management permits applicable to antlerless deer. While controlled hunting can be efficient, its effectiveness depends on factors like deer population size, land area, and local regulations. So consider a nuanced approach, recognizing that a combination of methods tailored to the unique circumstances and environment may offer the most practical solution. We also emphasize the need to adhere to ethical and sustainable practices, taking into account local laws and regulations related to hunting.
Ever wonder how farmers handle the challenges posed by birds? What creative methods do they use to protect their harvest from these aerial foes? Find out next. Let's now look at another problem, birds. Birds, especially starlings, bring about substantial challenges for farmers. Particularly those cultivating grain and diverse crops, the issues at hand are significant and impact various aspects of agricultural endeavors. One of the primary concerns is crop damage. Starlings have a penchant for wreaking havoc on a wide array of crops, such as strawberries, blueberries, grapes, tomatoes, peaches, figs, apples, and cherries. In newly sown grain fields, they pull up young plants and feast on the seeds, leading to substantial losses. The extent of their impact becomes glaringly evident when a flock of 4,000 starlings can swiftly cause significant revenue loss within a mere week in a vast vineyard. The economic toll extends further through grain theft, accounting for a staggering $800 million in annual losses for growers in the United States alone. The sheer number of starlings in a migrating flock, sometimes reaching up to 100,000 birds, results in widespread grain pilferage, crop destruction, and the displacement of native bird species. Livestock and poultry facilities also face quite a number of challenges due to starlings. These birds gather around feed troughs, depleting supplies of livestock feed at an alarming rate. A mere 1,000 birds can devour a staggering 100 pounds of grain daily. Surprisingly, reports suggest that crows might pull out garlic bulbs not for consumption, but to uncover insects lurking beneath. The economic implications of crow-related crop damage are not to be taken lightly either. Plant diseases alone incur a staggering $220 billion in global economic losses annually, while invasive insects contribute an additional $70 billion, which we'll dive into later. The accidental or intentional release of a major agricultural pathogen could lead to severe consequences, including production losses, market declines, and increased unemployment within the food and agriculture sector. Crows are not always bad news, though. They play a role in pest control by consuming a significant number of insects that pose threats to crops. Additionally, these birds serve as territorial protectors, warding off larger predators. Balancing the positive and negative aspects of crow behavior is crucial in understanding their role in the intricate web of nature and agriculture. But for now, we cannot ignore the negative. So let's look at ways in which farmers protect their crops from birds in general. Among the most effective methods is the use of bird seed treatments involve applying bird repellents directly to seeds before planting. These emit unpleasant scents, discouraging birds from approaching. Another is modifying the crop. Modifying the crop itself can be achieved through decoy crops strategically planted to divert birds away from the main crop. By now, you might be curious, which one of these methods is the most effective way to keep birds off your farm? According to research, bird netting is still the most effective and reliable method of preventing bird damage in vineyards and berries because it is a physical barrier. It is almost 100% effective when used properly. Bird netting is applied shortly before ripening and remains in place until harvest. In vineyards, it is applied after.
While these strategies can significantly reduce bird-related crop damage, a tailored approach is often necessary. Integrated pest management techniques, combining multiple deterrents, prove most effective. Other effective methods, apart from bird netting, are the Melnor Jet Spray Motion Sensor Water Sprinkler and the Poland Bird Repellent Outdoor Laser. But what about the smaller pests? How do rodents like voles and mice wreak havoc in agriculture? Let's find out next. But let's now switch our focus to rodents. Rodents, such as mice and voles, have long been unwelcome companions in the story of agriculture, inflicting substantial damage on crops and farm infrastructure. Their impact, deeply rooted in history, is not only a matter of agricultural concern, but extends to economic repercussions and public health. Let's delve into the intricate web of how rodents cause harm and the far-reaching consequences of their actions. If you were to focus solely on the damage they cause to crops, rodents with their insatiable appetites emerge as formidable adversaries to global cereal crops. Annihilating at least 1% annually, this percentage skyrockets to a troubling 3-5% in numerous third world nations. These creatures, drawn to vitamin and protein-rich foods, not only devour crops but strip away their germination capabilities and nutrients. The contamination of food stores through rodent feces and urine compounds the agricultural losses, diminishing both the quantity and quality of vital produce. Moreover, rodents, acting as carriers for over 60 transmissible diseases, introduce an additional layer of complexity. This disease transmission poses threats not only to crops, but also to humans, companion animals, and livestock, creating a nexus of challenges for public health and agriculture. Beyond the immediate impact on crops, rodents inflict millions of dollars in damages to essential farm infrastructure. Field crops, stored grain, and farm equipment fall victim to their destructive tendencies. The collateral damage extends to critical habitats, native plants and animals, and compromises the overall integrity of property and food supplies. The far-reaching consequences of this dual assault on both crops and infrastructure magnify the challenges faced by farmers, affecting both their immediate livelihoods and the broader agricultural supply chain. The economic effects of rodent-induced damage are also quite noticeable. Crop values suffer a significant blow, hindering farmers' capacity to meet the ever-growing market demand for agricultural products. The costs associated with controlling rodent populations, employing strategies like baited traps and ecologically based rodent management, EBRM, further escalate the financial burden on farmers. On a global scale, the economic fallout is staggering, with plant diseases exacerbated by rodent activities contributing to an annual loss exceeding $220 billion, while invasive insects incur at least $70 billion in costs. The role of rodents in these losses underscores their pervasive impact, influencing both suppliers and consumers within the complex framework of the global economy. Effectively managing agriculturally significant rodents emerges not just as an economic necessity, but as a vital component of ensuring food security, safety, and national public health. The battle against these pests encompasses more than safeguarding crop yields. It involves preserving the very foundations of a nation's well-being. Robust control measures are imperative, 
not only for sustaining agricultural productivity, but also for preserving the health and security of communities on a global scale. But how can you as a farmer achieve this? Well, implementing effective control methods is quite challenging. But we do have a detailed exploration of some key strategies that farmers employ to keep these pesky pests at bay. The first one is using rodent-proof storage facilities. Establishing rodent-proof storage facilities emerges as a critical measure for preventing infestations. Grain storage facilities serve the purpose of safeguarding against weather, moisture, rodents, birds, insects, and microorganisms. Recommended practices include storing rice in paddy form for food purposes, utilizing the husk for added protection against insects, and adhering to requirements such as moisture prevention, insect, rodent, and bird protection, efficient space utilization, and ease of maintenance. You could also consider baiting and trapping, Baiting and trapping prove effective in controlling rodent populations. Placing traps strategically along walls, near holes, or at right angles along beams disrupts their travel ways. Baiting with various food items like whole nuts, peanut butter, or small meat pieces enhances efficacy. While numerous rodenticides are available, it's crucial to consider that rats, being neophobic, may take weeks to approach baits or traps. Introducing natural predators, including barn owls, cats, dogs, foxes, coyotes, owls, hawks, and snakes, can also be a proactive strategy. Creating suitable habitats for these predators, such as wooden tree clumps for birds like owls to perch on, encourages a natural balance in controlling rodent populations. And lastly, maintaining clean, debris-free fields. Farmer-friendly and environmentally conscious, maintaining clean, debris-free fields is an essential control method. Swift removal of debris and trash, elevating wood piles and stacks of lumber at least 12 inches above the ground, storing garbage in rodent-proof containers, and securing grains and animal feed in similar containers are integral practices for effective rodent control. While each method plays a unique role, the synergy of these approaches proves most effective in managing rodent populations. A particular note is the farmer-friendly nature of maintaining clean fields, requiring minimal resources and easily integrating into regular farm maintenance. Importantly, these methods prioritize environmental friendliness, steering clear of harmful chemicals, and promoting sustainable agricultural practices. And finally, what about the tiniest invaders, the invasive insects? How do farmers combat these miniature threats? Stick around to discover. But the threat to your crops is not only brought on by the animals we discussed, there's more. Invasive insects. Invasive insects, those unwelcome intruders to our ecosystems, present a formidable challenge to agriculture and the economy. Their voracious appetites disrupt the delicate balance of crops, resulting in widespread damage and imposing substantial economic burdens. Let's explore in detail the impact of these invaders. Invasive insects unleash devastation upon crops as they feed on plants, compromising their health and stifling productivity. Some of the most destructive invaders go beyond merely feeding. They outright kill the plants or trees they infest. This triggers a domino effect, causing disruptions to other animals and various types of vegetation. For instance, the invasive Asian hornet in the UK disrupts biodiversity by preying on native bees and wasps, but it goes far beyond just destroying the crops.
The economic toll of invasive insects is staggering, reaching a minimum of $70 billion annually on a global scale. These relentless pests account for a colossal 40% loss in global crop production. In the United States alone, the economic fallout from invasive forest insects exceeds a hefty $4 billion each year. A recent study in 2021 estimated the cost incurred by North America due to invasive species, skyrocketing from $2 billion per year in the early 1960s to an alarming $26 billion per year since 2010. On a global scale, the economic cost of invasive species has amassed to a staggering $1.288 trillion over the past 50 years. These economic burdens encompass lost production, compromised quality, heightened production costs, reduced flexibility in production and management decisions, and an increased risk of human disease. Notably, the expenses incurred in cleaning up the aftermath of invasive species are 13 times higher than the costs allocated to managing these invasions. But they are insects, and often, climate change can also affect their presence. Adding to the complexity, climate change exacerbates the invasive insect problem. The interconnected nature of our globalized world offers these invaders new opportunities to infiltrate new habitats through intensified global trade, facilitated by cargo ships or airplanes. Deforestation and agricultural expansion expedite their spread. by providing easier access to pristine areas. The global challenge presented by invasive insect species demands a comprehensive strategy for control and management. A nuanced, multifaceted approach is essential. Let's now delve into some of the methods employed to combat and manage these invaders. First is the biological control, harnessing the power of nature. Biological control involves the intentional manipulation of natural enemies to control invasive pests or plants. In the realm of classical biological control of weeds, a variety of organisms, including insects, mites, nematodes, and pathogens, are enlisted. Extensive research and testing ensure that the introduced natural enemies specifically target the intended invasive species, minimizing unintended ecological consequences. You could also consider chemical control. The use of pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, and insecticides constitutes chemical control. While these chemicals can be highly effective, they also pose risks to other non-target species and the broader ecosystem. Careful consideration of the environmental impact and potential collateral damage is crucial when employing chemical control measures. Some farmers also use cultural control. This involves altering habits to either increase the mortality of invasives or reduce their rate of damage. Practices such as selecting pest-resistant crops, implementing winter cover crops, and adjusting planting dates fall under this category. Additional cultural methods include mulching, soil solarization with plastic film, thermal weed control, flaming, hot water and steam, prescribed burning, water manipulation, and prescribed grazing with domesticated herbivores. There's also more physical control. These hands-on methods employ tools or machines to physically intervene in the invasive species habitat. Mechanical control includes techniques like mowing, hoeing, tilling, girdling, chopping, and constructing barriers. Physical or manual control involves labor-intensive activities such as hand-pulling, digging, flooding, drawdowns, dredging, mulching, and manual removal of nests or egg masses. Now, let's explore specific case studies highlighting the challenges posed by invasive insect species. 
The Asian black-spined toad, similar to the notorious cane toad, raises significant ecological concerns. Its presence poses threats through competition with native species, the potential spread of exotic parasites and pathogens, and its inherent toxicity. Moving on to Argentine ants, these industrious insects function as farmers of aphids, causing havoc in horticultural crops. By fostering abundant aphid populations, they contribute to the destruction or reduction of yields. Next, the Asian honeybee with its broad floral appetite competes with native birds, mammals, and insects for pollen and nectar. Moreover, it vies for nesting sites in tree crevices, potentially disrupting local ecosystems. Shifting focus to avian borneviruses, these viruses threaten captive breeding and reintroduction programs for threatened parrots. The possibility of their escape into wild populations jeopardizes native parrot and passerine species. Lastly, the emerald furrow bee, recognized as one of the dirty dozen invasive species in Australia, adds to the challenges faced by local ecosystems. Its presence compounds the existing difficulties in maintaining ecological balance. These case studies underscore the urgent need for effective control methods. The intricate dance of combating invasive insect species requires a harmonized blend of biological, chemical, cultural, mechanical, and physical interventions.